This week we read the portion of Shlach, and this was the most devastating event which set us back tremendously. We're about to enter into the promised land. This was promised going back to Avram Avinu, the founding patriarch of the Jewish people. The land will be yours, your progeny, and all the future generations. Well, finally, about the tithe and not be fully engaged. And what happens? There's a glitch at the last moment. The Talmud tells us, a Jew lives outside Eretz Israel. It's as if he has no God. What does that mean exactly? So the commentators explain that the world is divided among the 70 root nations of the world. And each nation based on its spiritual makeup is at a certain location in the world. Every location, every nation has an archangel. The Romans have an archangel. The Germans have an archangel, the French have an archangel. Every nation has its archangel. And all the sustenance which comes to that nation and everything that determines the existence goes through that archangel. Eretz Israel, which is called Eretz HaKadosha, the Holy Land, has no, arch no archangel overseeing that. That location was given to the children of Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, the B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people. Our relation with God is direct. There's no intermediary. It's a direct relationship. We don't receive our sustenance through any archangel. It's directly from God. As a result of that, for the Jew to have that relationship that only he's qualified to have that relationship is only for an Eretz Yisrael. If a Jew lives outside of Eretz Yisrael, whatever sustenance he receives, it goes through that intermediary, that archangel of that particular location. As a result of that, it's Eloi Aloka. It's like he's cut off from God because rather than getting that sustenance direct from God, it comes through the intermediary of that archangel, which oversees that location, was that location's location of that particular nation. This is why it's cited, the Rechaim Akkad speaks about this, it's, brought, it's cited the Zohar, that a Jew does a mitzvah in Eretz Yisrael with no less commitment, with the same focus, with the same level of reverence, doing the mitzvah in Eretz Yisrael has greater value than doing the mitzvah outside of Eretz Yisrael. One who violates the Torah, God forbid, in Eretz Yisrael, the liability in Eretz Yisrael is much greater than if one violates the Torah at that same level outside of Eretz Yisrael. Why? Because Eretz Yisrael is referred to in the words of the Zohar as Paltin Shel Melech. You're in God's palace. Outside of Eretz Yisrael, you're in the hinterlands. You're not in the palace. To, to do the will of the king in his presence, it has greater value. That rather than doing it from a distance, violating the Torah, what, at whatever level, deliberate, defiant, or even inadvertent in his presence, it's a greater level of what? Of disrespect. Therefore, the graveness of that action is much more severe. You're violating the, his, the will of the king in his presence. Outside of Eretz Royal, which is overseen by the archangel, you're not in the palace. Therefore, although it's the same transgression, but the liability is not the same. When we were about to enter, we were given three mitzvahs when we went into Eretz Yisrael. One was to appoint the king. 
to annihilate Amalek and to build the base of Megdosh. Those were the three mitzvahs given to us when we entered the land. Of course, we had to conquer it, divide it. But at that point, there was a positive commandment to appoint the king. The first king was Shalom Melech, King Saul. And he was meant to annihilate Amalek. God says, my throne is not complete until Amalek is eradicated from existence. He talks to Shemaim. Kial Kesko. And Kisi Shlema, my throne is not complete till Amalek is totally removed from existence. That was Shola Melech. That was Saul's responsibility. He failed. So first we appointed the king. He was meant to annihilate Amalek. Then we were meant to build the base of Indosh. Shoal was lost opportunity. The Malchus does not come from Shoal. It's from Yehuda. David is Melchizedek. David will conquer the land. David's son will build, build the base of Megdosh. And that's the final, that's the Nachlo. That's the destination we have to arrive at. To fully flesh it out. And then our relation with God is at that special level. So coming to Eretz Yisrael now, about to enter into the land. And we have certain mitzvahs, it's referred to mitzvahs at Louis Baritz, mitzvahs that you can only fulfill only in Eretz Yisrael. You can't fulfill those mitzvahs outside Eretz Yisrael, whether it's, it's tithing of crops, whether it's bringing sacrifices at that special level. This could only be done only in Eretz Yisrael, not outside of Eretz Yisrael. So the mitzvah, the Torah in its, to its fullest extent will be actualized in Eretz Yisrael. So we're able to address every aspect of our spirituality or in Eretz Yisrael, it cannot be done. So this moment, at this moment, we've reached a moment about to go to the summit, literally the summit, to complete our objective, to achieve perfection at the last moment. We have this problem. The people, they want to know what, it's, what is it all about. We want scouts. We want to send scouts or spies to spy out the land. Why? I mean, God hasn't proven himself. You couldn't have survived the Egyptian armies unless God destroyed them. The splitting of the sea, the destruction of the armies, the wealth that you have, Egypt being destroyed in Egypt, the Esamakos, the giving Torah Sinai, the first set of tablets, the second Luchos, the Mishkan. I mean, God hasn't proven himself sufficiently. If God says, I'm giving you the land, I'm finally delivering it. But, you know, we want to see it for ourselves. We want to sound scouts to scout out the land. I mean, it's almost, it's, it's absurd. It's ludicrous. Could you imagine, if you read about history at the beginning of World War II, Hitler, Yamach Shemo, when he went into Poland, it was such an archaic army. Here they're coming with the panzers these tanks, which are monstrous tanks, which with one salvo, they can destroy a whole, a whole village. And they're coming to fight them with what? On horses. You don't understand what this is. It's like with bows and arrows. Are you for real? Here, God removed the mightiest civilization, the mightiest armies. You couldn't have done it yourself. And now you're going to Canaan. What is the question? Well, we want to enter to do a conquest. We want to see if we can do it. What do we want to see if we can do it? But God will do whatever you can do. You just have to take initiative. But yet, 
They said, we want to see for ourselves. We want to send spies. And that's what this is all about. You know, very often, when you raise a child, you have to allow the child to form on his face based on his own mistake. Not always catch him the last moment that he shouldn't feel the pain of his mistake. Why? Because unless he feels and internalizes the pain of his own mistake, he's not gonna make, he's not gonna appreciate the wrong that he had done. The Medjus tells us, factually speaking, when the Jews asked for, for scouts to scout out the land, at that moment they already forfeited the right to go into to Quran. They forfeited. Why? Because the Midrash explains it with a marshal, with an allegory. The king says to his son, the prince, I have a wife for you. She's beautiful. She's poised, intelligent, cultured. Any conceivable quality she possesses. So the prince says to his father, father, I believe you, but I want to see it for myself. So the king says to his son, if I don't have enough credibility that you should trust me based on just my, what I'm saying, you're not worthy to take that princess. You will not have her. God said to the Jewish people, what is Eretz Yisrael? What is Canaan? Eretz Zavos Chalubadvosh. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. When you come there, you will find Batim Leim Koltuf. The houses will be filled with treasures. There's nothing comparable to it. So God says, you mean I'm not sufficiently credible that my word is not the equivalent of fact, of reality? After all that I've proven and shown you that what I've provided for you, I brought about things which were impossible that I never did for any other nation. So what do you mean you want to see for yourselves? The moment you ask for spies, you already forfeited the right. So if you forfeited the right, why did God say he said spies? They immediately, they should have wanted for the 39 years. Anybody between 20 and 60 would die. And then why did he have to go through all the motions? To go, come back with the ominous reports, and yet 10 versus 2, and so on and so forth. Immediately, she should have said that, that there was this level of distrust. You forfeited the right to go in. And that there. Why, why was that enough? And not only that, by allowing it to play out, you didn't know what kind of level of Chil Hashem there was. It turned out Chil Hashem. 10 of the 12 spies come back with ominous reports. And they made statements which were unconscionable statements against God. And Kolev and Yifuna, they counted it, but it fell on deaf ears. And the people favored the 10 over the two. You know what's going on here? And the people are crying. They're bemoaning their fate. This is the B'chi Shel Chinom. This is the unwarranted crying. And God says, you were B'chi Shel Chinom, the night of Tishabov. It's when the spies came back. In the future, you'll have what to cry about. There are all the tr future tragedies that came upon the cloud shall happened on Tishabov, the night of Tishabov. So why did God allow all this to happen? It went from bad to worse. We made they missed they spoke out of turn, give them the slap on the wrist, put it in place. We'll wait forty years, let let it go from there. God allowed it to play out. As a result, that there was a public chil Hashem. The answer is because unless they would see for themselves how unacceptable this behavior is, it's unconscionable. They wouldn't appreciate why they, they they're losing the opportunity to go in. When they came back and they realized to what degree they sinned, and what level of chil Hashem they had brought about, they understood why that generation is not worthy to go in. They understood it in real time, as they say.
why they were, weren't not worthy to go and have that special relation with God, to go into the palace, to go into the palt and shel melech. Only the new generation went in. We find that trust is so essential and crucial to having a relation with Hashem. It may fail on many things. Person speaks Lashon Hara, person eats not kosher, person doesn't say Shema in time. These are transgressions. But the core of the relationship is, do I trust you, don't I trust you? We say in the bracha before the Shema, Lolam lo nevosh. God, we say to God, we should never be disgraced. Ki Because we have faith in you. Since we have faith in you, in the merit of that, we should never be disgraced. Lo nevosh lo ki That's how essential and base, basic trust is in Hashem. Lolam lo nevosh ki The breach over here, the failing of the Jewish people at this moment was they distrusted God. They said, God, all that you've done from the moment we left Egypt, or even in Egypt, was ultimately, it was a ploy to mislead us and convince us that we're going to the ultimate. But factually speaking, it's you taking us to a death trap. We saw it ourselves. Eretz Ochel Yishvel. It's the land which devours its, happen- its inhabitants. What is this? This is literally it's plunging a dagger into God's heart. I don't trust you. The level of unacceptability, the level of unconscionable behavior, not to trust God after all that he's shown you. God says, you will be condemned for the next 39 years, you're going to wander. There's even discussion in the Mishnah in Sanhedrin, whether the Dora Midbar, this generation of the Abishar in the world to come, that's how bad it was. You know, idolatry is one thing. They believed since Moshe may have died, they needed an intermediary because they're not worthy to have the relation with God. But this has none of the worthiness. This has to do with what? Distrust. This is the core at the, of the relationship between us and, 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 and Hashem. As a result of that, God says, it's unforgivable. You will not go in. So he had to allow it to play out for them to appreciate to what degree that failing was and is. And they understood it. So the next 40 years, including the first year they wandered. They did not go into the land. So the obvious question is, which the Medjish asks, the Orachim HaKadosh discusses, when they originally came, before Moshe presented their request, one of Moshe veto would immediately. He should have nipped it in the bud. Moshe Rabbeinu was fierce. When it came to Kovach Shemayim, to God's glory, if he felt to any degree it's being compromised, he would not tolerate it. And over here, he's treating them with kid gloves. He's considering. He's making their request, presenting it to Hashem. And Hashem responds, Shlach Lucha Noshim. So Rashi cites the Chazal, I've already told you what it's all about. It's Erezovus Cholubosh. But if you want to send spines, I allow it. I don't encourage it, but I allow it. Why? Why is God allowing it? So you can say, as we explained, because if we would not allow it, they're not going to appreciate how wrong, how bad their question is. That it's so rooted in a lack of faith. But what Moshe, Moshe should have nipped it in the bud. He should have vetoed it immediately. Why didn't he? Okay, discuss this. 
שלח לבן, נושים, ויסור את ארץ קנון. השם סיס את המושה, you should send for yourselves אנושים. So the Midrash tells us, אנושים means צדיקים. They should be, have a status of devout righteousness. And we'll see them among the gods, the one who chose who they should be. Every one of them. They were princes of the tribes. The Asur Eretz Eretz Canaan. They will scout out the land of Canaan. Asher in no saying, Levnei Yisrael. The land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Jewish people. You know, we hear things, but they don't resonate with us. For instance, the question is, I'm the Rechaim HaKadosh, asked this question. They will scout out the land of Canaan which I am giving to the Jewish people. That fact, that piece of information seems to be totally superfluous. I mean, this has been going on since Avram Avinu. The land be yours, your children and children's children forever. So God has to tell us now, when you send scouts, you scout out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to Jewish people. It's understood he's giving it to us. That's our land, it was promised us. So why is it important for the Torah to say at this point, that the scouts should know they're sending them to scout out the land that I am giving to the Jewish people. Why is that important for them to know? There's no question the Jews understood when they were caught between the Yamsuf and the Egyptian army, if the sea wouldn't have split, there's no way they could have survived. They would have been killed by the Egyptian army. It's only because the sea split and they were able to go through the Yamsuf and the Egyptians followed them. And when the Egyptians were caught between the walls of water, then the water closed on them. And that's how they were destroyed. No question, that's God's doing. And they understood the only way they could be saved at that moment, only if God immediately intervenes. He doesn't, they will all be killed. They're going to, to Quran. And what did they come back with reports? They saw giants could we conquer a land which has giants. It's not possible. But of course, what's even in consideration? Nobody ever said you have to destroy the giants. If God says the land will be yours, it's the land that I am giving you. If I am the gifter, I am the benefactor, evidently it's a setting which is livable. And it's a setting in which you will thrive there. But how do you coexist with giants? The answer is very simple. If I'm giving the land and there's nothing beyond God's ability, it's obvious, it's implicit in that, that God will remove the giants. There'll be no impediments. There'll be no threat. It will be fully positive. And God told them in advance, you're not just going to Canaan. You're going to Canaan, the land of Canaan that I am giving to you. I am delivering it to you. And if I am delivering it, there's no negative, negative side to that gift. Except that little piece, because of their own, we'll speak about this, lack of faith. They heard the words, but it didn't resonate. They believe they have to have that level of worthiness to merit the miracle. Even though God said up front, you don't have to worry about this. I will take care of it. A father has a special relationship with his son. And the son really never earned any serious money. And the father says to the son that because you're my son and I want to give you every opportunity, I'll give you a significant amount of money to invest. And I will watch from a distance to oversee, to make sure you don't do anything irresponsible. But I'll be there for you. And the son has that special relationship with his father. Does the son say to the father now, but dad, father, it doesn't make sense. Why should you do it? I may lose the money. There's a chance. Or maybe you may not give it to me. If the son understands the level of love and when the father says something, he means what he says. It doesn't retract what he says. The son doesn't even ask the question. If the son asks the question, there's a certain degree of doubt, and therefore the son is asking the question, is it possible? 
God says, I will, the land of Canaan that I promised to you, that I am giving it to you. I will give it to you that it's livable to be maintained and to thrive there. The way they saw it, it's not survival. Not possible. But you understand, it's not yours till you walk through that front door. That's when the giants won't be there any longer. All the issues won't be any longer. As we see later, the way they conquered Yericho for seven days, each day they encircled it once and blew the chauffeur. And on the seventh day, they encircled it seven times and they blew the chauffeurs, the ram's horns. What happened to the walls of Yericho? They sunk into the ground and immediately, what is this? That's called you, you conquer it. That's your victory. You just have to go through emotions. The victory is God brings victory. It's the land that I am giving to you. I am giving to the Israel. Meaning he's saying up front, for you it's impossible to conquer the land. I will make it possible that you should enter the land. Except as I said, because they lacked in trust and faith, the words fell on deaf ears. Therefore, when they were confronted with the reality of, gi of giants, they said, how are we gonna work this one out? It's impossible. God says, but you didn't hear what I said. They may have heard the words, but they didn't leave, believe the words. Because they didn't believe God was gonna carry through for them. But there's a story, I mentioned, told the story in the past, with the Chofetz Chaim, you know, Vilna was the stronghold of the masculine, of the Enlightenment movement. Vilna had a Jewish theater. Judaism was culture in Vilna. Vilna was a two-level community. You had the greatest Torah sages there on one hand, and you had Jews representing the secularization of, of the Jewish people. The Bundists, the Yiddishists, and all the Ists were there, and they represented Judaism as culture, and they had a Jewish theater. And whatever they could do to deprecate in this theater, to deprecate Judaism, and turn it into a, a comical situation, they did. These were, this was the light movement. So it was right before Purim and they put on a play. It was gonna be the Purim play. It was gonna be the last moment before the coming of Mashiach. It's gonna be the battle of the Armageddon against the Jewish people. That's what it was gonna be. And there was a certain student of the Rad Yeshiva, of the Chofetz Chaim Yeshiva, who had snuck into the theater. He wanted to see exactly what this was going to be. And he knew it would be something which would be very honorable for the Torah world. And he goes and he sits, he's sitting in the theater, the Zdok Theater, and they have the representation of the Armageddon and they have the representation of the Jewish people. What do they have? Who's representing the Jewish people? They have three people, old men, with beards bent over, and they're holding an 18th century musket, like the pilgrims had, such a musket. And the musket is so heavy, these three old men can barely hold it. One of these old people was Rav Shemit Shkop, who was one of the leading Torah sages, pre-World War II Europe. It was the Chovetz Chaim and Rav Chaim Moser, the three leading holy Torah sages of Europe. And the three of them are holding this ancient musket and they aim the musket at the Armageddon, which are literally millions of troops coming to destroy the Jewish people. And you have these three holy rabbis that are holding this musket and they, all three of them put their finger on the trigger because they don't have enough strength even to pull the trigger. They have to have this joint effort to pull the trigger on this musket. And they realize they have to say a bracha 
before they pull the trigger. Why? Because they probably going to be killed. Kiddush Hashem to sanctify God's name. So therefore, they close their eyes because they want to say the bracha with kavana, with full focus and intent. And as they're saying the bracha, they're holding it and they're swaying with this musket because they're having this kavana. And then when they conclude the bracha, they pull the trigger. What happens when they pull the trigger? A little ball, a little cannibal rolls out of the front of this musket and you can visualize, hits the floor. And as it hits the floor, the millions of the Armageddon just drop. They're all killed. And the place is laughing. The windows are shaking. This yeshiva student sees this, the level of mockery and how they deprecate what's going to be, he can't contain himself. He runs out of the theater, travels immediately back to Rodden, comes into the Chavetz Chaim and he says, you can't imagine how we were disgraced today in Vilna in the Jewish theater. And he sees the, this yeshiva student can't contain himself. He's so upset. So he says, tell me exactly what it was about. And he gives him a point by point replication of what he saw. And he says, and finally, when they pulled the trigger and they did a mockery of you and the two other of your great colleagues were sages, it fell out, hit the floor, and the millions of troops, enemy died. And they were, couldn't contain themselves. So he says, why are you laughing? Why are you upset? That's exactly what's going to happen. When they will step on is Israel's soil, Eretz Kadosha, as it says in the Navi, their flesh will fall off their bodies. Their eyes will fall out of their sockets. They will totally disintegrate. That's going to be what's going to happen. It's the land of Tan Asher Ani No Siddhiv Nei Yisrael. I'm the one who's giving it. The moment the Jewish Jews step on, cross that Yardin and step on the soil of Eretz Yisrael, these giants disintegrate. All the enemies are removed immediately. They don't exist any longer. It's not for you to conquer. It's for you to do. You have to go through the motions. Therefore, the Torah goes out of its way and says, Asher, I need no sin of Nei Yisrael. It's the land that I am giving. I, if I'm giving it, it's going to be delivered tenant-free, giant-free, problem-free. That's going to be. However, he says, I'm not shame. The people you send have to be tzaddikim. I'm not shame is tzaddikim. Ish echad, ish echad, lamate avosam. Each person has to represent one of the tribes. Kol nosibem. And their status, they have to be princes, princes of the tribes. So this Farno points out over here, why did they have to be of this prestigious qualification and this caliber of person? She so says, the Sifarno explains, when the spies came back with their reports, everything they said, fact-wise, what they saw was accurate. They did not lie. They did not lie whatsoever. It's only the way they read the script they read the script wrongly. But in terms of what they said they saw, they saw giants. Wherever they went, they saw people burying their dead. It's accurate. But the question is why? Why were they burying their dead? Why were people dying? Is it because it's a land that normal, ordinary people cannot survive it? Or it's because God brought a plague upon them that they should be immersed in their grief, that you should go, when you enter to scout out the land, you should go unnoticed. That's the question. What exactly, how do you read that script? Call him in Yeshua, because of their trust in God, they read it exactly as they should read it. The other 10 who did not trust God, and they saw this as a ploy to destroy them, 
They said, it's obvious. This only confirms our suspicions that God's intent is only to destroy us. Not as Khalif and Yeshua. They said, it's preposterous what you say. It's so far-fetched, it's not even plausible to be considered. That's how the 10 reacted to the two. But if you believe in, you have trust in Hashem, there's nothing preposterous, and it's not remote, it's reality. And you always see it as reality. The person, the non-believer, sees believing God, you know, you're some kind of archaic person. You're out of touch with reality. You know, why don't you open your eyes and see the sun? What you're seeing is totally irrational. They see, the one who sees it right, he's the rational one, but they're rational. They're so conflicted, they can't see beyond their noses. They don't see the forest from the trees. But the person who sees it right, he's irrational. So therefore, they had to be of that caliber. Because afterwards, when the Jews realized the mistake they made, they understood the facts that they reported. There's another reading on those facts. But let's say they would have falsified the facts. They would have been a low-class scout, spy. They would have falsified the facts. When you falsify these facts, now you have to go say they made, they made up the facts. Here, the facts are identical. What Yeshua and Kolev are saying, well, it's identical. It's how to interpret the facts. So once they had clarity, they realized the mistake they made, and therefore they bemoaned that they, they actually understood how they failed and how seriously they failed because of that. There's a very fundamental question which is asked. It says when they left, they left, they were tzaddikim. They were chosen as anoshim tzaddikim. But yet we find when they returned, the Torah tells us, they went and they returned. El Moshe Aaron. They returned, they went straight to Moshe Aaron. So Rashi cites the Chazal, which is the Gemara. What is, it says they went and they came to equate the coming and the going with the same intent. Just as when they returned, they ran, they returned with this evil intent, with this negative mindset. When they left, they left with that same intent. Negative. But we just said, they were Anoshim. They were Tzadikim. And yet the Pasuk says, it's indicated from the verse, that they had the same mindset when they left as when they returned. So how do we reconcile it? So there's a very fundamental, beautiful, or Chaim HaKadosh explains that there's a concept in law, Jewish law. The Torah says that a man marries a Jewish woman. A man wants to terminate that relationship. He wants to divorce her. Torah says, the husband marries his wife, the husband divorces his wife. What happens if the person chooses to appoint an agent to represent him to offer the ring a marriage on behalf of a third party? Could one appoint an agent to be the equivalent of the person himself? Could a man, although the Torah says a man divorces his wife, what about if he chooses to appoint an agent to give the rid of the divorce, what we call the get on his behalf? Or the woman doesn't want to see the husband or be associated, she appoints an agent to receive the get on her behalf. The divorce is finalized, it's valid. Because we have a principle, shlucho shalodim kamoso. The agent of a person is the equivalent of himself. When a person is appointed to be the stead of another person, he assumes that halachic status of the person himself. Now, what lies within this principle? That means there's a connection between 
the agent and the one who he represents. The Nisim, these people who are initially with Tzadikim, when they initially were with Tzadikim, but then they were appointed to represent each of their tribes. The people themselves had a serious problem with trust in, in Hashem. So they themselves, representing each one of these tribes who had serious issues, that linkage created uh, some level of doubt within the context of trust. So therefore, initially, before they became the agents of the people, they were with tzaddikim. The moment they actually attached to the system, being their agents, there was this halacha connection, then there was some level of influence because they were spiritually attached. And that's what it means, as that when they returned, they returned with an evil intent. When they went, they already went with the intent, because when they left to go, they went as the agents of each of the tribes that they represented. This is the Orachim HaKadosh. So what I wanted to say, as you say it in the negative, you could say the same thing in the positive. A person initially is a tzaddik, but if you link to a person who's far from that, his Achilles heel, because you attach to it, you're affected by his deficiency. The agent is affected by his deficiency because you represent him in this context. What about a person who's a great tzaddik? And he appoints you to be his agent to go on a mission on his behalf. If the tzaddik does, engages himself, he personally is worthy of a great level of siyata dishmaya. God, divine assistance. We say tzaddik goes at Kodesh Mokbakayim. The tzaddik decrees, the Hashem brings that decree to fruition. So the agent who represents the tzaddik, who is he linked to? He's linked to the tzaddik. So the siyata dishmaya, which the tzaddik merits, that, that siyata dishmaya will pass on to the agent because the agent is linked to the tzaddik to fulfill the agency of the tzaddik who commissioned him to be his agent. As we say the negative, we're able to say it in the positive. So the viability and the effect and the value of the agent takes on a new level of value because he's linked to a source, which is a very special source. We find by the building of the Mishkan, all the, the order to build every aspect of the Mishkan, it's to Moshe Rabbeinu personally. Moshe, you do this, you do that. It was never to the Jewish people. When it came to gather the materials, the Yichudi Truma, we needed 13 materials, gold, silver, copper, and all the other materials to build the Mishkan. That was an obligation of all Jews. But the actual making, building the Mishkan, that was directly to Moshe. You do this, you do that. Moshe, having everybody else participate, they were his agents. That's the Archaim HaKadosh writes over there. That's why it's in the individual, said individually, not in the plural. Moshe, when he transmitted the responsibility to every Jew, to the artisans, to build the Mishkan, every Jew was the agent of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? So Archaim HaKadosh explains, because Hashem wanted that even though Moshe didn't participate in the actual building in the Mishkan, but he's a beneficiary of that building because every person who participated was Moshe's agent. And based on the principle of Shluch Shom Oso, that one's agent is equivalent of him, it's as if Moshe built every aspect of the Mishkan. That's how the Orchaim HaKadosh learns that what the laws of agency brought about, therefore was said in the singular. So Moshe now gives the order to the Jewish people, and they are his agents, that he should be the beneficiary of building the Mishkanites in totality. That's the Rechaim HaKadosh. Now, we find that 
Betzala oversaw the Mishkan. Now, who is Betzala? The Torah describes who he was. He had special level of divine inspiration. And the Gemara tells us that he was able to conjugate the letters of the Aleph base to understand exactly how creation came about. Although he's only 13 years old, he's endowed with a special level of wisdom. Why did you have to be endowed with that level of wisdom? So he explained that the Mishkan itself was the microcosm of existence, of creation. So for the Mishkan to function, to be the equivalent of that, to parallel with all existence, the terrestrial, the celestial, it had to be infused with a certain kavana, with an intent through which creation came about. So everything needed that infusion. Otherwise, its effectiveness wouldn't have been the same. It's just not gold tapestries. It's not just gold vessels. It's not just vertical beams. It's much more than that. Every one of those part, parts of the Mishkan is a representation of creation because it was infused with that special kavara, with that special intent. So that, that the people had done that, it's as if Moshe did it. Now, everybody has a certain capacity. Go about IQ, intelligent quotient. If you have that, you can't surpass it. And if you can, it's only through divine intervention. That all of a sudden, you see things and understand things at another level. That's called Siyatid Dishmaya. Because odd God's intervening, giving you a greater level, a greater capacity. Moshe Rabbeinu Shoko connected to Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu is the equivalent of the Jewish people. The Jewish people building the Mishkan, the Klal Yisrael, being the agents of Moshe, what level of siyat and shmaya does each one of these individuals merit? They're individuals. If the mitzvah would have been to them, they're individuals. But now they're linked to who? They're linked to a person who's the equivalent of the whole Jewish people combined. So what level of siyat and shmaya does one merit being linked to such a person? And not just an ordinary person. He's a person that was one of a kind of person that nobody ever walked the face of the earth in terms of the spiritual dimension of Moshe Rabbeinu. So God particularly formed the relationship between Moshe and the Jewish people, the obligations upon Moshe. The people themselves, they are his agents. Being his agents, the link to what source? This is the source of totality of spirituality. Therefore, the Siyat and they merit so now the horizons they come upon to understand certain significant concepts, to be able to infuse the Mishkan with a level of infusion which not is compared, but compared to that, that was only because they were linked to Moshe Rabbeinu. Therefore, they merited this broad and depth of understanding which they couldn't have had if they wouldn't have been linked to Moshe Rabbeinu. So it's only because the mitzvah was given to Moshe, therefore they were able to achieve that level of understanding Breath and depth, because they merit that endowment, because they are an extension of Moshe Rabbeinu himself, for that reason. Rashi cites the Chazal, Shlach Lecha Anoshim, send for yourself, meaning I've, I've, I've told them what it's about. If you agree they should go, let them go. It's your prerogative. I'm not encouraging it. But if you feel it's okay, I will not stop you. That's Shlach Lecha. But there's another interpretation. The Jews are ready, they forfeited the right to go into Eretz Yisrael. They're going to wander now for another 39 years. Moshe Rabbeinu, if the Jews would have gone in immediately, what would have happened to Moshe? Moshe would have passed away. So that level of influence of having Moshe to be their leader and to be under his guidance and his exposure would have come to an end. If the Jews would have gone in right away. Now, because there's been a hold put on their entry, 39 years, now Moshe Rabbeinu 
is in a leadership position for another 39 years. So he explains the Orchaim Shlach Lechon notion. It's in your best interest that these spies should go. Because as a result of the going, they showed a lack of trust. Therefore, they're not going in. Because they're not going in, you're living another 39 years. Living another 39 years, besides serving Hashem on a personal level, you'll be guiding them and influencing him for an additional 39 years. So therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu was the ultimate beneficiary of the Chet Maraglim. Because now he doesn't pass away when he's meant to pass away, because everything's been put on hold for the next 39 years. We're going to stop here today. Boy.